a senior executive advisor with Booz Allen Hamilton. And on behalf of Booz Allen Hamilton, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this afternoon's program. Um, I love the title. It's uh, not topical at all. This is purely a hypothetical discussion this afternoon. Uh, no, I actually take the title a little bit personally because, as some of you may know, I spent um, almost four decades in government, and most of the mistakes that they'll talk about today I made. Um, we uh, actually, in partnership with the Partnership for Public Service, uh, wrote a report on the lessons learned from the last round of downsizing. It's uh, on your chair. Uh, we spent a lot of time interviewing people who were around the last time we went through an exercise like this, which was um, uh, mostly in the 90s, although other, uh, some agencies have been going through this almost perpetually uh, for the last couple of decades. But we had a chance to interview a lot of people and put some of those lessons down on paper. And um, we have some of the experts we talked to and a couple more uh, this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to let John Palguda uh, introduce our distinguished panel. It's my pleasure to introduce John. Um, I actually uh, did a Google search before um, I came here this afternoon, and you know that John is the second most quoted person in Washington behind President Obama. <laughs> Every time you turn around, uh, John is being quoted in his capacity as uh, the policy guy for the Partnership for Public Service. And he's really done a tremendous job at that because he's able to tell it like it is. There are some uh, significant challenges facing the public service these days. And uh, I think it, we're fortunate to have John uh, there as a commentator on many of these issues. And he's joined by the rest of our panel. Uh, John um, formerly was head of research for the Merit Systems Protection Board, but um, uh, for the last several years has been operating in the capacity with the partnership. So, uh, Mr. Palguda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, and, uh, and good luck. Ron, thank, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thanks to, to Ron for all that he has done. Uh, and, and thanks for that very kind introduction. Uh, if I actually have anything to say when I'm quoted in the media, it's because I'm smart enough to hang around with some really smart people, Ron being one of them for many years, but also the folks on this panel, which uh, I, I'm really delighted uh, to have this group. If you went to any of the other sessions, don't tell any of those folks, but this is the best panel in this whole <laughs> conference. Uh, let me tell you, you've got their bios in there, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but so you don't have to go back and read the stuff right now. Let me give you a, a flavor for, for who we have up here to talk about what I think is a, a really compelling uh, topic. Uh, Catherine Nelson uh, is uh, Senior Vice President uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton, based in D.C. Uh, she's the firm's CFO, uh, Chief Financial Officer, Agenda Executive Lead, and, and brings 30 years' experience uh, on federal, uh, well, public sector financial management and the federal uh, chief financial officer uh, agenda. Uh, and, uh, you know, she is, uh, you know, just uh, someone who really knows the, the money end of things, which, of course, drives a lot uh, about what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, to uh, Catherine's left is uh, Don Kettle, uh, someone that uh, I've greatly admired. Uh, back from his days when uh, he was teaching at the university that both my daughters graduated from undergrad, and that's University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, but Don is uh, currently dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, uh, a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. Uh, prior to uh, uh, University of Maryland, he also taught at University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, University of Virginia, Vanderbilt University, and University of Wisconsin. So obviously a moving target, <laughs> uh, but he's also, you know, he's written 20 books. I mean, I, I do a little tiny report or something and I'm exhausted. Uh, 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 Don's the author of more than 20 books, uh, including The Next Government of the United States, Why Our Institutions Fail Us and How to Fix Them. Uh, and uh, among all of your great accomplishments, Don, I did not realize that you're also a shareholder of the Green Bay Packers. That's a Super Bowl champion Green Bay Packers. <laughs> So at the end, you can ask him some football questions. Uh, just nothing about the Redskins, please. I, I couldn't take it. Uh, and then uh, my, my very good friend uh, to the far left, uh, just in terms geographically right. speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, <laughs> Bob Tobias uh, is currently director of public sector executive education at American University, uh, teaches and ministers the key executive leadership program uh, that, you know, they've got uh, currently about 320 federal leaders? 500 
500. You got to update your your bio. Yes, I do. Uh, but I, I printed out his CV, 15 pages. Uh, but so I'm not going to go over all 15. But uh, I will also tell you uh, he's the director of the Institute for the Study of Public Policy Implementation, which he founded at American University. But prior to uh, going to AU, uh, Bob served for 31 years with the National Treasury Employees Union. Uh, and from 83 to 99, he was the president. But probably the most distinguished part of, of Bob's uh, background is that uh, he had this idea. If you read the papers today or yesterday or follow some of the, the uh, blog, anybody see anything about best places to work in the federal government rankings? Uh, okay, Bob uh, really had that idea. Uh, I, I, it's the, the kind of the Martin Luther King, I had a dream. <laughs> uh, he had a dream about, you know, uh, getting, uh, finding a way to use feedback from federal employees to really drive constructive change in government. And uh, came to the partnership early on in our 10-year history and said, you know, how would you like to partner on, on this, uh, putting this idea into place? Uh, we did. Uh, it launched in 2003. Our 2011 rankings were released yesterday, and it's really become a force for uh, change within government. As uh, leaders learn uh, how to use uh, feedback from employees to deal with challenges, some of which we're going to be discussing in just one moment, uh, and, uh, but also how to make the, the organization uh, better, more effective. It's not about happy employees. It's about effective government, effective uh, government organizations. So. Uh, you know, wonderful panel up here, and um, let's jump right into it. Uh, this is lessons from the last downsizing, and one common theme here is that all of us were focused on uh, what was happening to government uh, from one perspective or another uh, during the last major downsizing, uh, which was the reinvention of government during the Clinton administration. Uh, Don was at University of Wisconsin cranking out some wonderful reports uh, looking at the impact of reinvention. Uh, you know, Bob was uh, very much in the mix, and uh, Catherine, as you heard, was dealing with the CFO community. Uh, and uh, right now, the, you know, uh, we're going through another period of downsizing. Let me ask a uh, show of hands, how many of the folks are, uh, here are currently in government agencies? Most of you. How many of you expect your agency to see some sort of downsizing? about everybody who's in an agency. Uh, last question, how many of you are in an agency where you have too many resources? <laughs> Nobody. There's one hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk to you later. Um, but in, during, the, uh, during the 90s, uh, some people uh, may not realize, and I was inside government at the time, uh, at the time the, the downsizing effort started, it was really a, a record-keeping sort of, you know, we're going to, we're going to make government uh, work better, cost less, and one of the metrics was we're going to, you know, be able to do it with fewer people. At the end of that period, there were 350,000, and the number varies depending on your start and stop date, but roughly 350,000 fewer federal employees on the payroll. Uh, you know, and going through that sort of a downsizing effort, you know, some things happen, some things work. They, they, all the, the intent behind the reinvention was good and noble, and they, it really was focused on trying to make government work better. Some of it worked, some of it not so much. So um, we're going to kind of uh, just, just oppose or, uh, or take those lessons uh, and apply it to where we are now. Uh, and see if there's some things that we can learn from what happened then to what we're facing now. Uh, in the next couple days, the Super Committee is supposed to be releasing uh, its uh, uh, results or lack of results, and that's going to be causing, uh, I'm sure, some things to happen. Maybe we can start teeing up for that now. So let me, let me uh, start. Uh, for our panel, and, and we're going to start by with you, Bob, and we're going to work our way down, then it's going to be uh, open conversation. But I want to start with um, the, the results of the Super Committee. We don't know what they are yet, but we know they've got to come up with a huge amount of savings, and if they don't, uh, some automatic things go uh, you know, uh, into, into place. Um, what, uh, Bob, uh, starting with you, what should agency officials be thinking about now in anticipation of whatever recommendations or whatever cuts are, are going to come out 
um, that are, are you know there's going to have to result in some cutback in spending and, and people probably. But what should they be thinking about now? Is there anything they can be doing or should be doing to prepare, uh, or is it just well let's wait to see uh, till we see what we got? Um, anybody who waits to see what they have will be months behind where they should be. I think everyone in this room anticipates um, accurately that there are going to be fewer funds in 12, there are going to be fewer funds in 13, there are going to be fewer funds in 14. So the question that I would be asking if I were the head of an agency, if I were head of a department, is how do I manage what I know is inevitably going to occur. Because if I don't, what I'm going to be stuck with is across the board cuts. I'm going to be totally reactive. I will have given up my chance to be proactive. I will have given up my chance to be thoughtful about where the cuts occur, how they occur, when they occur. I'll just have to do across the board cuts, which of course, as anyone in government knows, is the worst of all kind of managing. It doesn't take into account which programs are more important. It doesn't take into account which programs might need more funds rather than less funds. And it doesn't take into account what in any anticipated uh, benefit from reengineering new processes. Um, it's the worst. So if I'm not thinking now about cuts in the future, because I say, well, you know, I don't know whether it's going to be 3% or 5% or 7%, so I'll just wait until I have an absolute number so I can make an absolute decision. I think that's wrong-headed. Don? I just couldn't agree more. If we've learned anything, it's that uh, there are big cuts coming, they're inevitable. There are presidential candidates who are talking about abolishing two or three, or it depends how many they can remember, cabinet departments. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, but it, that gives you an idea of the level of conversation and analysis that lies behind some of this. Uh, we can abolish the Commerce Department, but somebody's still going to want to have to run the Weather Service and collect the data to feed the information to the Weather Channel. We can abolish the Department of Energy, but at some point somebody's got to be in charge of taking care of the nuclear waste and managing the nuclear weapons that are sitting around. Each of these questions gets inevitably to the issue about uh, the, remember the, sort of the great moment in the 1992 vice presidential debate with Admiral Stockdale, <laughs> who was sitting there between the, these two superstars and saying, who am I and what am I doing here? Uh, this is going to be an Admiral Stockdale moment for everybody who works for the federal government. Who am I and what am I doing here? And to put the most positive piece on it, which I believe is the only way to come at this, is it's an opportunity to sit and ask what is it that we are and what is it that we want to do and how are we going to achieve our core mission? Because the dirty, awful, rotten secret about most of this downsizing debate is that most of it really doesn't have to do fundamentally with peeling back missions. We're talking about eliminating departments but not, for the most part, eliminating functions. And most of the things that we now do, I don't hear anybody saying we don't want to do much longer, seriously. And the serious conversations about eliminating functions don't last very long. So the fundamental challenge for managers and for leaders is to try to figure out who are we and what are we doing here? What is the answer to our Admiral Stockdale question? And how can we try to focus squarely on that mission and to try to drive everything that we have in the best way that we can to make sure that we can accomplish that mission? And in the end, it comes down to a matter of leading people in that process as well. Uh, I've gone through a process at, at our place where we've had three years of, of furloughs, forget about hiring freezes and forget about salary increases. We've had furloughs for three years in a row. And it's forced us to ask fundamental questions about what is our mission and what do we want to do and how do we motivate our employees day in and day out so that we come in and turn on the computers in the morning that they're psyched about doing their job. And the most important things that managers can do, as Bob suggests, is not to wait and see what happens because everybody else is reading the newspapers. The most important <laughs> thing that we can do is figure out and communicate clearly what is it that we're doing, how are we going to do it, and how are we going to motivate our employees to make sure that the job gets done. Thank you, Don. And, and Catherine, I hang out with the HR people in government, but you hang out with the money people. So 
What's your perspective? So I actually hang out with money people and IT people a lot, but I actually agree with Don and Bob. I think, but I come at this from a little bit of a different angle. Um, while I recognize that there's significant pressure and imperative right now with the budgets and 2013 and 2014 and so on, I actually see this as a new normal. There, there's a big difference between what happened in the 90s and now. We weren't in an economic crisis in the 90s the way we are now. I think this, the taxpayers were asking for transparency and things like that. And there were some in incentives to move towards reinventing government, but it's not the same incentive that in the same situation that we're sitting in now. These organizations, while they need to look at what they're going to do in 2013 and 2014 and 2015, I don't think it's going to change in the longer run. And I think what that means is that leaders need to be thinking about sustained efficiency and effectiveness for their organizations. So going actually to, to, to Don's point about making themselves relevant from a mission perspective. And I think that it's going to require more than management. To me, management is tactical. It's about cost identifying where you can get savings and taking budget cuts. And while that is part of the equation, that should not be the primary part of the equation. The equation is actually about making your mi being relevant in terms of the missions that are our uh, U.S. citizens demand. And it's about looking at those missions, regardless of organizational boundaries or component boundaries or role that you have, so you're not looking just at your rice bowl. It's about saying, wh what do we need? What are the requirements? And then balancing all of those and delivering against that promise. And I think in the long run, if, if it, it, it's going to require transformative change to get to that sustained efficiencies. And I actually would put effectiveness first instead of efficiency. Again, it's not about cost cutting, it's about what can we deliver towards the mission for the dollars, the shrinking dollars that we have. And hopefully, through change, we can get more. And it's going to take re-engineering, it's, it's going to take innovative thinking, and it's going to take leaders who are thinking strategically and who are also thinking outside the box. And it's going to take a dedicated workforce. So I know that, that one of the things that we talk about using the term downsizing, it implies that we're downsizing our human capital. And I actually think that's sort of wrongheaded. Um, I think that we need to look at where we've got extra, but that doesn't mean it's the workforce in, in all cases. And maybe what we need to do is retrain some of our workforce and do some things like that. So we need to be thinking as leaders about what the implications are so that we can deliver against the promise and be relevant for our, our constituents. Thank you. And I'm going, I want to follow up on something that you mentioned, Catherine, but let me also mention to you, uh, we're going to have time for questions uh, before this panel is over. So start thinking about some things that you might want to pose to these people. But also, uh, if you've got some uh, perspectives or experiences to share, would love to know those too. So you might be thinking about that. But Catherine, you, you made a, a very uh, 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 good point. The condition in the 90s is actually the environment that we were working in, in, in the downsizing, uh, is very different from what we're facing right now. Uh, you may recall that uh, we were actually at a time of budget surplus. Uh, we were in a time of relative peace. And, and uh, the, the goal, the, the motivation to downsize the workforce uh, wasn't uh, budget related as much as it was we want to demonstrate that we can make government more effective uh, and it doesn't cost it doesn't have to cost a lot more and in some cases what agencies found was if they if they didn't have the people uh, they could buy uh, some contract assistance so let me pose to the panel no particular order here uh, the, you know we're in a different situation now uh, it is money driven it's that you know we, we don't have enough uh, revenue to you know to operate uh, at our current levels uh, so my question is what the difference in environment what kind of impact does that have in terms of what the leadership of government or Congress should be thinking about in terms of how we go about whatever downsizing we're going to um, go through um, I'd actually like to start I, I think that the budget 
I mean, the budget crisis is real. Obviously, we've got to cut back. We, we're going to get either we're going to get something out of super committee or we're going to get sequestration. There are going to be with sequestration. We there are certain things that are not going to be touched, um, but there's going to be equal cuts across the board to defense and non-defense. But it's going to be against discretionary budget. I think that one of the things that that the government needs to think about is looking at the non-discretionary, the entitlement programs, and we can't treat those like a third rail. And I know that David Walker and others had looked at some some uh, opportunities to think about those programs in the past, and, and I think we need to revisit that. Um, so I, I think that is a huge issue. The other thing is the mission side. We really need to look at what are the key missions that the government needs to do, and we need to do that regardless of organization. But the thing that I think we struggle with is that our governing bodies, the, the lawmaking branch, for example, the House, uh, Senate, they aren't, the way they make laws and the way they appropriate and things like that doesn't exactly align to the way we actually spend money, and it's very difficult to get that alignment in terms of, so you might have an agency head that says, here's where I want to go, but because of the timing of the budget cycle and things like that, you can't make changes very quickly. And then, of course, OMB is organization focused in many cases, not necessarily all about mission focus. And they don't have visibility in some cases across organization to multiple missions where you can get savings. And I think that some of those fundamental things will have to change. And those are going to be different than an agency head making decisions. OK. Uh, let me just sort of go into rewind quickly and a quick look at the last 20 years of the politics of this. Why is it that the Clinton administration decided to reinvent government? There was no big budget crisis at the time, at least nothing remotely like what it is we have now. The biggest answer had to do with politics. And the political answer had to do with the fact that Admiral Stockdale's running mate, Ross Perot, actually won 18% of the vote in 1992. And the Clinton people very shrewdly looked at the politics and said, you know, whoever does, who gets the Perot voters next time around wins. And what is it the Perot voters were caring about? And the answer was, uh, you made me may remember Ross Perot with all these great charts and flow charts <laughs> and these, uh, he was sort of a PowerPoint guru before there was really PowerPoint, flipping charts over and trying to show that we really needed to get control of the government, cut spending and to improve results. And so the administration embraced that strategy to try to grab the pro voters and to isolate pro off to the side. So it was largely a political strategy for very good reasons, but its main genesis had to do with politics which then meant when Al Gore ran for president in 2000, of course, he spent his entire campaign talking about reinventing government, right? Absolutely not. He barely even mentioned it. So the paradox there is that having launched it for political reasons, it gave him no political traction at all. Second, fast forward a little bit. Uh, George W. Bush, so wild up and down roller coaster in popularity. What was the one event that created the political situation from which he never recovered? It wasn't mission accomplished on the aircraft carrier. It was Hurricane Katrina. The failure of Katrina was the point at which his negatives exceeded his positives, and he never politically recovered. So here was something that, where they didn't pay enough attention to the managerial results, and they got creamed for it. So we have an effort to try to pursue it for reasons of politics and having politics not matter, an effort to try to not pursue it for reasons of politics and having the politics matter a lot, and the situation now where everybody knows that we need to make fundamental decisions and the only smart thing to do in that situation is to duck the question and to talk about cutting symbols. And that means cutting federal agencies, two or three or however many you can remember to cut, or uh, eliminating federal departments in terms of uh, other things that you're going to just hive off, reduce the number of federal employees by 10 percent. There's some wild numbers in the air as a way of just don't stand there, look like you're doing something, but without really engaging the issue. So the problem here is, on the one hand, something completely different because the fiscal crisis is huge and it's enormous. But what is absolutely central to each of these things is a lack of engagement between the strategy and the mission. In each case, it was an effort to try to do things for lots of interesting political reasons, but missing the mission piece. And the, that's both an enormous problem because we will have a discussion about eliminating federal agencies without thinking about what it is that the agencies do and whether we want to abolish the missions in the process, because we won't talk about that. That's much too complicated. But 
we will, on the other hand, while we're creating this kind of mischief, be creating opportunity for managers to do exactly what you've said, which is uh, while there are all the shooting wars going on outside, federal leaders and their agencies have a chance in this tough environment, recognizing it's a new normal and the problem's not going to go away, to focus on here's what it is that we do and here's why it's important, here's how we're, we're going to get it done, and here's how we're going to demonstrate our results. And that's the opportunity that is out there that, in fact, has to be seized, and that's both the negative and the upside of the situation in which we find ourselves. Well, I, I don't disagree one whit with what Don just said. I'd like to extend that. Let's assume that strategy and mission are linked. Let's assume that you, your boss, you have agreed on what needs to be done. What's missing often from this conversation is what behavior do you need to change in order to effectively implement the changes, the structural and the money changes in your agency. How do you maintain an engaged workforce? Because we all know, we all know that when employees are not engaged, the productivity goes down. We're in an environment now, do more with less, whatever, however that shakes out, do more with less. I'm not going to do more with less if I'm not engaged. And what we know, certainly from best places to work since its inception, is that the one factor that makes, has made a difference in every organizational segment, in every single survey, is the quality of the leadership. And I suggest that it is not possible to implement any of these great ideas, any of these great thoughts, without authentic engagement, without those who lead authentically engaging their, those they lead. And I don't mean just at the top. I mean at every level of government. Am I willing to do what I need to do to remove the barriers between me and those I lead. Because I ask you how long it takes you as you look up to discover whether or not your boss is behaving authentically, a heartbeat. And the same is true for you with respect to those you lead. And I also suggest that to the extent your boss lacks authenticity is the distance between you and your boss. And until that engagement occurs, there won't be that authentic engagement occurs, it doesn't matter what we do intellectually. It doesn't matter how smart we are, what we'll, which of course is important. But equally important is what behavior we change to implement the plan we put in place. That's very good. And I want to pick up uh, on something you just uh, remarked upon, Don. Yeah, the, the basis of our democracy is an informed electorate. And it concerns me that um, I think a lot of the, the general public really doesn't have a good idea about what the results of government are. Um, and the, um, you know, in, in the uh, 90s, they were looking for a way to, to kind of demonstrate results, keep, keep score. And they came up with you know, a head count being a, a major one there. Uh, and they could show that the number of employees was, was going down. Uh, we could talk about whether that was a, a good measure or metric or not. But really, my, my question is, for the folks in this room who are in government agencies and, and the government leaders, uh, they need to, I think, uh, demonstrate to the public the results of what they're doing, especially going forward. Uh, and it remind people what you know benefits or services are, are, are being provided and at what cost, but that's a tough thing to do. So if, if, we, if we are able to avoid the headcount approach, how do we demonstrate, how should government be demonstrating uh, the, the results that they're producing? I mean, what, how do we communicate to the general public about what they're getting from government and whether it's a, a reasonable return on the investment of their tax dollar? You know, John, I would settle for awareness of what the government does. I mean, I'm, 
I'm, I'm sort of stuck by the person who was picketing with the Tea Party sign that said, government, keep your hands off my social security, right? Totally unaware of where that came from or who was writing those checks. Now, if, if, if I don't have that kind of a link between what you do and how you are perceived, it seems to me that our first real effort is Social Security brought to you by the federal government, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, this bridge brought to you by the federal government and reminding people, you know, all of this stuff on the mall brought to you by the federal government. Um, you know, you might remember during the government shutdown how people were stunned when they couldn't walk into, you know, the museums on the mall. They were furious. What do you mean I can't go to the museum? Well, brought to you by the federal government. Um, and, I, and, and it's really only half in jest. How well have we really branded what we do? Not so much. You know, the Treasury Department did something kind of interesting a few years ago to try to distinguish the, um, the Internal Revenue Service from the Department of Treasury. I anybody <laughs> who writes a check, you know, is supposed to write it to the Department of Treasury, not to the Internal Revenue Service, who only collects the money, doesn't make the tax policy. Now, I don't know, that's kind of a subtle distinction, but that was one of the goals, to distinguish the Internal Revenue Service from the Department of Treasury. Um, but the next time you look at a label on the food brought to you by the federal government, just a thought. Now, one of the things that, that strikes me is uh, I remember back to a, a great Andy Rooney report back, I guess it was about, it must have been 1990 or thereabouts, and he had a camera crew riding down Constitution Avenue with a camera panning all the buildings, and he said, what do all those people do? And so some of this is nothing new, but the fact is nobody had a very good answer for it. Nobody still has a very good answer for it along the lines of what Bob suggests. And the problem at the core is this, that federal government essentially has two kinds of employees, the people in the service business and people in the leverage business. There are large numbers of federal employees who actually are involved in direct provision, even though collecting your taxes doesn't feel like much of a service when it's the IRS. And when we have to take our shoes off at the airport, it doesn't feel like much of a service when the TSA is keeping us safe from the bad guys. But you take that, those two, plus Social Security, and then you add on air traffic controllers, and you've got a pretty good slice of the people involved in the direct service provision are actually doing things for us. But most federal employees are really in the leverage business, and their job is to do what they do and leverage, in some cases, thousands, millions, billions of dollars. Uh, we've got 20% of all federal money going to, to Medicare and Medicaid being managed by 0.2% of all federal employees. That's pretty amazing. And it says something about what it is that feds do, but also how hard it is to talk about it, because it's not the feds themselves who are doing what it is that they do. It's working through this process, which is part of the reason why people just don't understand what this is very well. But that gets down to the more basic question, which is absolutely the cutting edge of everything that we're talking about in government these days, of how to demonstrate value for the dollars that taxpayers invest in us. And we just are not very good at that. But the, the parallel piece to the what's our mission has got to be how do we demonstrate value for what we do. Part of that is the, the kind of game that you win in part just by showing up. Just by showing up and engaging the question is in itself an important part of this, recognizing that it's an important question and beginning to talk about it. But we have a really tough time answering that question for two reasons. One is we don't really know what kind of information will best communicate that. Uh, for example, uh, recovery.gov has got an app that you can get for your iPhone. And I have it here in the, my iPhone in my pocket. We can find out to the block where Recovery Act money was spent anywhere in the country. Put in the zip code and you can find out on your block how much money is being spent by which agencies. It's pretty stunning, which is incredible. And nobody knows it exists. And nobody knows what to do with it if you get it. So 
this, this problem of transparency of getting information out, of figuring out how to engage people in that kind of question. But even a bigger filter at this point is that, well, we all know that uh, we're sitting right next door to the job-killing EPA and just down the street from the job-killing IRS, <laughs> and we're around the corner from the job-killing Commerce Department, and we have people who on top of that are federal employees, so we know that they obviously can't be doing much of any kind of real value, and the best thing we can do is try to eliminate their agencies and their jobs because we have this higher level of rhetoric where we've convinced ourselves that we can somehow have an intelligent conversation about this stuff without really talking about anything. If we can we throw nasty labels on things, we can have a lot of fun and fill up a lot of air time without really engaging the issue. So some of this means that our political leaders have got to try to be, shoot straight with us, but they actually don't see much percentage in doing it. But we know that deep down that's a more fundamental piece that we have to try to get at. But on the other hand, no matter which agencies we eliminate and how much downsizing we engage in, I get a sneaking suspicion, and let me say, how many of you are from Washington, the Washington area, uh, that uh, in February you're going to want to forecast about when it's going to start to snow and know what the implications are if it does, God forbid, at 4.30 in the afternoon? <laughs> and, <laughs> and knowing that the, for better or worse, that is your federal government at work because the basic data that provide predictions about how much snow there's going to be and when it's going to start come from observations and from satellites that are under the operation of the federal government. And so, like it or not, there are at the bottom, even if it's the, the job-killing EPA or the job-killing Weather Service or the job-killing <laughs> Commerce Department, that one way or another, uh, we want to know whether or not it's going to snow. And it's that business of trying to engage citizens directly and getting back to Bob's basic question that's really the core of this. Yeah. Um, uh, how many of you have read a performance accountability report in here, ever? Have you, have you seen them? They're like this big. How many of you actually listened to the guy speaking, lunch, uh, speaking at lunch today about pictures? And <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things the government does, just like any, I mean, you saw these, you know, thousand page reports, that the government puts out a lot of information actually about what they do and how <coughs> they perform but they don't make it meaningful or legible or even put it in terms where it seems relevant to us. And I will tell you, so for people living in the D.C. area, we, we hear a lot, we see a lot if you listen to the news or you watch or you read the Washington Post or, wa even, or the Washington Times or whatever, you're actually being inundated with information. But if you go outside, I would even say 50 miles outside of the D.C. area, as close as that. People don't know what the agencies do. Even people who work for the government in Oklahoma City or in Dallas, Texas or Houston or wherever it is, they don't know what other government agencies do even when they work for an agency. I would actually say there are a lot of people in here that don't know what other departments do even when they work for a department. And so I think to your point, uh, I think it may have been Bob, the government doesn't brand itself well, and they don't report well on what they're doing. Their performance reports are like concrete. They are not outcome-based, so they, and they don't make it easy for us to understand what service they're providing and how they're relevant. Now, that doesn't say that everything that the government does is relevant. I actually don't believe it is, although I don't want to get rid of the EPA or the commerce or whatever. Um, Great. But, That's good. But I think, <laughs> I think that there's redundancy in government, and I think that there are missions that are no longer relevant, and that's where the leaders come into play. They have the opportunity to bring visibility at the enterprise level that crosses organizations and makes us think about what business we should be in as, as, government, as a government. So for you feds in the room, uh, you know, kind of the, the lesson coming out here is that you know, we've all got a job to do at the macro level to better get the message out about what we do. And based on what Catherine was just saying, we also have to make sure that what we're doing is really the best thing or the best way to do it uh, because um, you know, we may not be able to afford to do everything. We're go going to have to make some choices. But my last question, I want to take us down to the tactical level because almost every Fed in this uh, uh, room also said that they expect they're going to have to figure out how to get their job done, get the mission accomplished 
with fewer resources uh, down the road. And even if you don't get a budget cut, you may get a workload increase that is unfunded uh, or there's expenses increasing. So in the, uh, you don't have to read it right now, but if, you're, if you don't have in your hands or in your bag the, the Smart Cuts report, that's because you're sitting on it, because one was left on every chair, so. Just uh, report right here. <laughs> so in there, my, my last question goes to the eight strategies that were outlined. I'm gonna just quickly mention the eight strategies for downsizing. And then this, dis the, the, the last part of this discussion is, how do we you know, make use of those strategies or should we make use of those strategies individually or, or in combination? And then I wanna get a sense from you as to what sorts of challenges you're facing uh, the panel may have some, uh, some advice on, or you may have some advice for the rest of us. But at the tactical level, there, uh, what we learned from the 90s was that there's uh, eight basic strategies that were put into play if you had to downsize. One was that you know, across the board uh, cut, whether it's in people or, or budget, uh, you know, everybody can take a, uh, you know, live with a 10% reduction. I mean, you just tighten your belt. Uh, so, and we don't have to, you know, make uh, great distinctions. We'll just, you know, 10% less and you figure out how to deal with it. That's one strategy. Another strategy is programmatic cuts. Prioritize and reduce programs or functions selectively and probably disproportionately. Some places get cut more than others. Or, uh, and this was a, a favorite during reinvention, was we'll decrease administrative cost. We've got all these overhead jobs, the HR folks, the budget folks, the acquisition folks. Uh, you know, let's get rid of some of those and we'll move resources to the front line uh, to serve the public. So decrease administrative cost. Uh, strategy four, uh, reduce the size of the workforce. 350,000 fewer people, uh, you know, uh, was the end result of that strategy. And, and you, know, we can, you, know, you can do a, a, a direct comparison. We know how you know, the average salary is X times 250,000, that's your savings. So that's another strategy. Uh, five, consolidate or centralize functions. We don't need a bunch of individual HR offices. We can have some centralized HR offices in, the, in our major agencies, our budget offices, our acquisition, or, or, or what have you, or IT. Uh, uh, sixth strategy was re-engineering. If we can't do more with less, maybe we can do something different with less. So we'll kind of re-engineer our work processes or re-engineer how we get things done. Uh, seventh strategy uh, that was tried uh, was uh, we'll just invest more uh, in IT. You know, there's more that we can automate uh, and, and we'll get some, some savings there. Or five or eight, uh, uh, you know, I guess a, you know, another one was get people can count. Uh, <laughs> but the, the eighth strategy was, uh, you know, we can outsource to lower cost providers or even, you know, outsource within government. Uh, so you kind of a franchise basis. If there's another agency can, that can do it better and cheaper, uh, you know, we'll shift the work over there or we'll shift it to outside of government. So those are eight strategies that folks put into play during, uh, uh, the 90s. Everybody in this room is saying we're going to have to figure out how to, you know, downsize or at least deal with fewer resources. Of this combination of strategies, uh, uh, if you're advising an agency head, or let's say you're, you end up being an agency head, uh, which strategies do you look at favorably? Which do you want to avoid? Or do you avoid any of them and just say, you know, we're, gonna, we're just going to figure out which ones work best? How do you, how do you uh, tactically now, these folks have to do it. What's your advice to them? So I, I would actually say that a combination of all of these strategies will work, but I think that the thing that's important for leaders is to not jump into it. So we, we started the conversation about waiting until we hear about what's coming out of the super committee. Well, actually agency heads and leaders should be thinking about what various strategies they can follow right now and they need to lead through this. I think a big challenge is going to be actually the change management and then the visioning and the planning for it. So while that's not tactical by nature, it's almost more strategic. I think that, that any all of these strategies will work, but I think it's important to plan and it's important to understand the impacts and to do the cost benefit of whatever strategy you follow or set of strategies that you follow. Um, and I, I'll give you an example. I was actually at DHS this morning and I was talking to 
some folks in, in the Undersecretary for Management, and one of the things that they're struggling with is if we look at the mission of providing air service or, or stuff like that, and they have, they actually have several fleets of aircraft. And so the Coast Guard actually has a fleet of helicopters and CBP, the Customs and Border Protection, has a fleet of helicopters. Customs and Border Protection operates helicopters with two doors. Coast Guard operates helicopters with one door. They have two separate contractors or services, they aren't even contractors, to provide maintenance because one helicopter is configured differently than the other helicopter. And I think it means thinking differently. And they're paying a million dollars more, by the way, for the two-door helicopter than they are for the one-door helicopter. So I think that it just means thinking differently, but they have to look at all of these strategies in combination. And they need to be bold about how they do it. That, that would be my advice. Okay. Let me start out. Two things that, that don't make sense. Uh, there's no such thing as a hiring freeze. And there's no such thing as an across-the-board cut because you can announce it and make it stick for, for 36 hours. But then uh, you're running the air traffic control tower in Cleveland, and three of the controllers come in having read all the newspaper headlines and said, that's it, I've had it, I'm retiring. And that's the day you don't want to fly into Cleveland if you have just an across-the-board cut that, or a hiring freeze where you're just not going to allow people to replace the workers. There are some functions that simply cannot be allowed to function that way, or they don't function. And so there's some things that we know are just non-starters, even if we announce them. So how, but on the other hand, how are we going to come at this? Because it's clear that what we've got to do is keep, take our game up a notch. That even doing a combination of what it is we've done in the past, we've got to do it in a different kind of way if we're going to be able to get traction. Because if we knew how to get to where we want to go, given what we have in our table now, we'd already be there. So one of the tricks is really figuring out how do we take our game up a notch. And part of this is can we reimagine the problems that we're trying to deal with. I, I think back to, remember I said there's this app that the recovery.gov has on recovery, dot, uh, recovery uh, programs that are being managed out there. And so I, I put it up a, on a PowerPoint and on a display pr like this one for a group of college freshmen. And I said, here, give me your zip code. So I put it in there and popped them up. And there were all these dots that started coming up. And within about 90 seconds, one of the college freshmen asked exactly the right question. Different programs run by four different agencies. What if they're talking to each other? <laughs> exactly. College freshmen, 90 seconds, the right question. Two, two lessons from this. This, by the way, is, is part of this, this basic list, but by figuring out how to analyze and present data in different kinds of ways, different kinds of performance information can produce different kinds of conversation. The second thing is where I suspect a massive opportunity for a breakthrough lies is in recognizing the fact, and members of Congress hugely appreciate this point, uh, people don't live in programs. People don't live in agencies. People live in communities. And what they want is the government to be real in the communities in which they live. And the more that we can find a way to engage that conversation, again, the graphical stuff really helps to try to pull some of this together in a way that a college freshman can understand in 90 seconds the more that we have these opportunities for maybe creating this kind of breakthrough that we need. Um, although Don is correct that there's no such thing as an across-the-board cut, there is across-the-board cuts that apply to very large numbers of people. And I don't disagree with anything that's been said that we need a combination of things, but I would say across the board cuts stink and are very inefficient and very ineffective. But what combination of the other strategies you put together ought be part of your proactive analysis and application? But one of the things that I think is often not considered is how many people do I really want? to do what's left in my new restructured organization? Do I want to keep the same number or almost the same number and a trit? Or do I want to plan, as has been suggested, that this is a new normal, and calculate employee costs as fully loaded, including the training costs, including 
the travel costs? Or do I want to ignore that for three or four or five or six or seven years and not fully support those who are left? I think that's a fundamental question that's often ignored. And the other question that I think is ignored, particularly in this town that's filled with people who are all about public policy creation and not public policy implementation. We have great ideas and you know all the juice in the papers are about public policy creation. And the only time people like you are highlighted is when somebody screws up. So once the head of the agency or the group in the agency decides the strategic direction, that's the what. I come back to what's the how. What's the how? How is whatever is ultimately decided going to get implemented? And I believe that it can't get implemented the, the significant organizational change effort can't occur except in an authentic environment where leaders are behaving authentically and transparently. So I have some more questions, but uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, hold off on those because I want to hear from you. Uh, what do you want to know or what are you willing to share in terms of things that uh, are effective or may be effective going forward or issues that you see. So um, anybody? Over there. <coughs> I have a how question. If we really are looking at what we do, what our mission is, and that mission is based on outcomes, on the actual results. So for example, it isn't how many permits does the water office at EPA put out, it's what difference does it make in terms of clean water. We don't do our work by ourselves. You talked about that. Do you think, this is a hope question, do you think that there is possibility we can use this crisis as opportunity to actually change how government functions so that we're bringing together around the outcomes all of the partners, the stakeholders, not just at federal level, so we start to change within the federal structure who does what, and we don't have so much duplication or separation of functions, but we also could be partnering in ways with the states and even local government, but at least at the state level. Uh, in my thinking, that's the direction we need to be going, but I don't have a high level of hope, particularly because Congress would have to make an awful lot of changes to our laws. But, but that, that, that could be a fourth or fifth level resort, but not doesn't have to be the first. Uh, we may be all in favor of eliminating the job killing EPA or whatever it is that you want to do, but let me tell you, and I, I'm, I'll apologize in advance, I'm seeking a point of personal privilege here. I live a block and a half from the Chesapeake Bay, and we may be opposed to the EPA, what the EPA does in theory and principle, but I don't know anybody who would be in favor of allowing one of the country's best resources to continue its decline, to allow crabs and oysters to disappear. And I say this is a, I, I, I'm a dean at the University of Maryland, and it's part of my job contract to protect crabs and oysters. I've got to, that's one of the things I have to say at every opportunity. But the, Good. But, but the thing, <laughs> But the thing is that the, it's the, where I think we might go is moving away from managing the EPA to saving the bay. And when you start about saving the bay, we had a case where there was a massive flooding further up north, and we had refrigerators floating down the bay in Maryland, and nobody, I don't think anybody threw a refrigerator in, and I know it was nobody in Maryland, it came from up in Pennsylvania or maybe up in New York that floated <laughs> down and ended up in our bay. But if you're interested in trying to save the bay, what that says is, wait a minute, uh, it is a bad piece of public policy to have refrigerators floating through the Chesapeake Bay. So what, that's a bad thing. 
how would we go about doing it? Well, whose refrigerator was it? What kind of policies and partnerships can we create to try to prevent that sort of thing from happening? Uh, there are, the Chesapeake Bay is a very complex environment, but part of the problem of cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay means that uh, we're about to enjoy lots of poultry in the next week, and there are big poultry farms on the eastern shore, and there are all kinds of things that best not discussed in, in polite company that happen to the, the waste that comes along with poultry farms. And part of the problem of saving the bay means preventing waste from washing into the bay whenever it rains. That's not a big problem in Prince George's County, on the other hand. There, there's a massive amount of stormwater runoff that pollutes the bay from a different kind of source. So instead of saying we're going to have a stormwater problem, we're going to have an agricultural program, uh, we're going to save the bay. And we understand that each of them have differential com contributions to the same <coughs> waterway and the same kinds of problems. And it's a lot easier talking about trying to make the bay healthier to try to help crabs than it is to worry about we're going to force extra costs on poultry farmers to try to prevent stormwater runoff from causing contamination. They started to get into all kinds of mumbo jumbo that people just don't understand. I think the more that we can focus back on exactly your question, but focusing on it's the bay we want to try to protect, not the program we want to manage. And the more we do that, uh, you get anybody here, if, let me just, I don't want to go further, anybody here in favor of killing the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, but on the other hand, you could go out, and I, my guess is if I ask this question in a broad audience, nobody would say, yeah, absolutely. But there would be people who would be in favor of killing the EPA. And the problem is, as long as you focus on the wrong question, we're likely to lead to the wrong answer. If we can change the question, we're more likely to get the kind of collaboration that we need. And the Bay, ultimately, is the kind of resource, along with health care and transportation and mass transit and a variety of other kinds of things, that we can only attack by looking at the problem and organizing and understanding all of our contributions to the problem instead of trying to manage each of them individually. But I think the more we talk about that, the more we have a potential for breaking through a lot of the superheated but incredibly hollow rhetoric that's undermining our ability to be able to get to where we want to go. I, I would add just one thing to, to this and to address your hope question. You talked about state and local. You talked about uh, community governments, et cetera. I think there's also the opportunity for public-private partnerships. I think if we're asking the right questions, you'll identify the stakeholders, and it becomes a larger group than just government. And I think we are all part of a larger community, whether we work for the government or not, and that we have an opportunity to do the right thing. So that's my, my hope statement. Great. So focusing on the end result, getting that consensus agreement, and then focusing on the how best to get there. Uh, great. Other uh, questions over here? I live in the part of Pennsylvania that had the flooding that sent the refrigerators. You, so you, you're the one who sent us the refrigerators. <laughs> so uh, my question is, I, individual uh, government agencies, I think, are really good about having developed uh, consumer satisfaction questionnaires. Um, and, and I think they've done an extraordinary job at that. But I wonder if you could address how much effort has there been um, in agencies uh, going to the consumers and seeing how they could collaborate better. For instance, in this flooding, um, not only did these folks need FEMA assistance, their real estate value went down. A lot of them wanted their mortgage uh, refinanced and wanted to go through the federal program. So, but they had to keep going from place to place to place. So I'm wondering if there's any efforts to uh, <laughs> having consumer-driven consolidation or re-engineering of services. Let me sort of jump in on, in two ways. First is, uh, there a, a truly amazing thing happened in the middle of those floods. Uh, one of them, several amazing things. One is that there weren't a large collection of FEMA horror stories. The second thing is that, uh, that FEMA had this idea. They went back and looked at what had happened during Katrina and said, you know, Walmart and Home Depot were back in business faster than we were. So we, can we learn something about supply chain management from them? The answer is, Yes. Third thing, uh, when the storm was coming, they called Home Depot and they said, which of your stores are going to be back in business fastest and which are going to be equipped? Because what we don't want to do is to put up a FEMA shelter and a FEMA supply center in your parking lot in front of an open store. 
doesn't make much sense. So what, what FEMA did is to say, let's go where Home Depot isn't. Let's go where Walmart can't reopen or where there isn't a Walmart. And so that we, they relied on this public-private partnership to be able to get this to work. And part of this has to do with understanding how, how markets and the government can interact in ways that make everybody better off. Because uh, you, uh, you can be against government, but boy, when there was water rising outside your front door, the boat from the government can't get there fast enough. Can you find a way to get a, collaborat a collaboration between the public and the private sectors in a way that is much more productive? The supply chain management piece coupled with public-private coordination and a true partnership is an incredible breakthrough that's got almost no headlines, but FEMA has created a world-class innovation here in the process of pursuing some of the things that you're talking about. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, over here. Oh, you got what? You got a mic uh, right there. Thank you. Well, I'm not a Fed, but I work with them very frequently. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was the conversation around what does employee engagement look like in the federal government, especially in time of budget cuts and, and crisis. And I can tell you from talking to program and project managers in particular that sometimes it's difficult for them to articulate how their project or their program relates to the mission. Um, they don't always either believe that it does relate to the mission or maybe they don't understand. So how can that be filtered down all the way to the, those people whose productivity would most probably benefit this effectiveness and efficiency um, initiative? Bob? Well, one of, the, um, one of the things that we might have an opportunity to really look at is the creation and implementation of effective performance management system. And the, the most important infrastructure of a performance management system is how my job is linked to the mission of the organization or the mission of the agency. The research shows that the only thing that really motivates people to work harder is the extent to which they can identify how their work is connected to mission, the mission of the agency. And I think we significantly under leverage, Don is talking about leveraging, I think we significantly under leverage why people come to the federal government. They come because they want to make a difference. They come because they want to matter. And yet, we're careless with how we assign work. We're careless about where we put people in, agent, in, in organizations. We're careless about how we engage them. We're careless about how we evaluate them. It seems to me that in this time, installing performance effective performance management system would be a great thing. And let me uh, suggest a, a resource too that you know, might be helpful for some folks in the room. Uh, you know, the employee engagement is really the, the focus of the best places to work, and and there's copies of the uh, brochure for best places of Inbase base interested for 2011, which was announced yesterday, uh, and it would you know, give you the website address, bestplacestowork.org. I would uh, suggest you take a look at, uh, there's a, a, a place under the uh, analysis section there that gives them agency profiles. Uh, and one of the things uh, that, that we've been doing at the, the partnership, when agencies have succeeded in increasing the amount of employee commitment and engagement, uh, we ask them and, and reflect it in the scores they get from their own employees responding to this government-wide survey. Uh, we asked the agencies, well, you know, boy, you, you went up, and we, we talked to the agencies whose scores go down, and we said, was this a surprise to you? Uh, you know, was it a happy accident if it went up? Uh, or were you surprised that, you know, that your employee satisfaction scores went down? The answer inevitably is no, not really. For those who went up, it's, let me tell you the, the you know, eight initiatives we undertook uh, to engage better with our employees. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was the number one ranked agency among large agencies this time. Anybody here from FDIC? They're all back working like crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it started, they were in 2005, out of the 30 large agencies, they were number 25. 
In 2011, they're number one. Shelia Beer, the, the head of FDIC, uh, you know, looked at this and she says, you know, we're a financial agency. We were in a financial crisis in this country. Uh, you know, we need to do our part better as FDIC, like all the other agencies. But I can't do it without my employees helping me. And uh, there's a little profile that talks about all the things they did. And it's not dissimilar to things that they're doing at uh, Social Security Administration, which is one of the top 10, dealing with huge workload increases and decreased resources. Panner Trademark Office, huge backlog, but uh, you know, they, they managed to increase their employee engagement. Uh, and, you talk, and you listen to David Capos, the head of PTO, he'll tell you everything he did to get his employees involved in answering the how. How do we you know, get our job done better uh, and, um, you know, and they, you know, the employees, when they're surveyed the next year, they're saying, hey, we feel a better sense of, of commitment to this because, you know, we're helping uh, on the how. So I would simply offer that for all the federal managers in the room. Uh, one of the few things that if, if I learned anything as a manager myself was I don't have to do it all myself. My employees can make me better uh, if I give them that opportunity. So the employee engagement question, which is the heart of your question, I think is, uh, you know, is right on point. It is another tool uh, that we can use to you know, get the, the, the job of government done, uh, even in times of, of tight resources. Um, we've got a, a, a few more minutes. Uh, yes, sir. There seems to be a kind of a pretty strong undercurrent that even if cuts happen, programs, missions won't go away. And I, a couple of you have used the example of the National Weather Service a couple of times. That makes me kind of curious because I think there may be a, a kind of a general uh, uh, feeling across the country that, you know what, if we keep taking money away from government and it keeps performing all the same missions, maybe it didn't need the money. So rather <coughs> than maybe just simply saying, you know, brought to you by the federal government, what would happen if someone says, well, let's eliminate the Department of Commerce and the response is, you know, maybe a couple of missions go to other agencies, but maybe we just eliminate the National Weather Service. Does that set a different tone? <laughs> is that a reasonable strategy? Well, great question. It might be reasonable, but who in Congress would actually vote to eliminate the Weather Service? It's very easy to stand in front of a crowd and say, let's get rid of government. Let's get rid of three, eight, three departments. And then, of course, when the time comes to vote, are you going to eliminate the Weather Service? Absolutely not. So it's, you know, as Don said, it's hollow rhetoric. Congress is, many in Congress, not all, but many in Congress are full of rhetoric. <laughs> wait, wait, no, 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 wait. Pause. Like, I gotta stop you there. <laughs> are you serious? So, but unwilling to make the kind of decision that you just, that you just suggested. Um, the assumption is, well, there are slots out there in the federal workforce, and if we just whip them a little harder, they're going to be able to do everything that we've asked them to do. Because if they come back and say to us, which programs do you want to cut? We don't need to cut programs. You just need to work harder. So I don't think realistically that there are going to be any programs that get cut by the Congress, even though the resources um, will decline. But yeah, I, I'd like to answer this yeah. question because I actually uh, want to come at this a little differently because I think that our agency heads are going to be having to make tough decisions. And I think it isn't about doing more with less. I think it's about doing the high priority things with less. It's about optimizing every dollar so that you get the, high, the most for that dollar. Um, and what it's going to mean is making very strategic and very surgical cuts, which will involve changing mission, or at least the way you support the mission. And um, I, use, I use an example with, and, and this may be somewhat made up, but I, somebody said it to me, and so I'm going to share it with you. The Marine Corps, they do a lot of training of soldiers, and one of the things that they do is they train soldiers on using amphibious vehicles. 
And the fact is they have a whole training program that might be focused on that. And the fact is that soldiers don't enter countries using amphibious vehicles the way they did 30 years ago or 20 years ago even. They go in in planes and helicopters and things like that. And so why would you have a program or require a capability that would train people on amphibious vehicles? And so while it may not change the mission directly, it's changing the capabilities that you need in support of the mission. It's looking at the requirement, saying here's the mission, what are my requirements in order to achieve the mission? Are all my missions still relevant? Because they may not be, and some may be more relevant than others, but I do believe we're going to be looking at our missions and, and changing our priorities. Yeah, and there, your question also, uh, and Don, I'll ask you to come in on this, uh, uh, raises the, the possibility that maybe the, uh, there's legitimacy in some cases to the star of the beast strategy, that you know, if we want to get a handle on government, if we can just, if we just reduce sources, resources, uh, you know, folks will find a way to get the job done and, and you know, we'll eliminate fraud, waste, mismanagement, fat, what have you. Yeah, I think the, the public, I say this because I haven't seen polls exactly on all these points lately, but there are polling results on some. Uh, people don't much like the government, don't much trust the government, don't much trust the federal government in particular, and in general they tend to trust governmental institutions that are closer. They trust states more than the feds and locals more than the states. And so the further away from the citizen that the government is, the less people tend to trust it. There's a sense that most federal employees don't work very hard, are overcompensated, have benefits that are too rich, and therefore we ought to be able to uh, engage in substantial reductions in the workforce without fundamentally undermining the mission. Uh, now, how close that is to reality, we all know. But here's my, because I hope I've been able to communicate that I at least am, and in this difficult situation, fundamentally an optimist, because I think there are tremendous opportunities. But my biggest worry is the following that what will happen is that everybody will say, well, of course, we can, we can engage in dramatic cuts uh, at 5 percent, 10 percent of the workforce without really fundamentally altering the mission because of all of what I've just said. And the reality, of course, doesn't match up. Agencies will have to try to reprioritize as best they can within this. And then what we'll have are, are more stories on 60 Minutes and in USA Today and elsewhere about, here's your federal government screwing up again. And the reason in part is that we don't have enough feds to make sure that the job gets done. And it will further increase the incentive to try to engage in further cuts to the federal government and federal government programs because just as we thought, the federal government doesn't work very well. And that, I worry, is a kind of spiral into which we could find ourselves that I think is extremely dangerous. Uh, there, one example of this is that uh, we all know that there are significant amounts of fraud in the Medicare program. How much? You can sort of take your pick of the numbers. There are numbers that range from $10 billion to as high as some estimates that I've seen, as high as $75 billion a year of waste in the Medicare program. And we, we all know that's, that's just awful. And so what do the people out there doing the job obviously are not doing the job right, are they? Well, there are almost none of them doing it. The, the total workforce managing Medicare and Medicaid is about 5,000 employees, 5,000 people managing 20% of the entire federal budget. So whatever it is that's happening, it's obviously not them screwing up because most of the work that's done is obviously not done by them. But the argument that's made about the poor performance by federal employees is really a problem of not having the right number of people with the right skills in the right places to leverage the work that's being done out there. So my real worry is that we will get increasingly out of sync between the strategic capacity that we need to do what is we commit ourselves to do and the rhetoric which will drive even more of this and widen the gap. That's, that's sort of, that's the nightmare scenario. That's the doomsday scenario for some of this stuff, which we could find ourselves in unless we're really careful. On the one side, as Catherine suggested, there are inescapable challenges and important strategic pieces. Uh, there are also some really fundamental challenges that, that lie ahead that we're gonna have to have an honest conversation with us as a country that really lie beyond the strategic ability of individual leaders to solve on their own. But uh, there, this is a time where, uh, unlike the, the case in the 1990s where there was a sense, I think, that uh, we'll just get through this and, and Clinton will go away and Gore will lose interest and we'll go back to normal, this isn't gonna happen. I mean, where we are is 
I think, as Catherine suggested, the middle where we're going to be for a very long time. Thank you. And we are going to stop there because we, we've reached the end of our time. But uh, hopefully uh, you all uh, agree with me that we've gotten some great food for thought. For all of you federal employees out there, uh, I can tell you that all four of us really appreciate the work you're doing. And I also want to tell you that I very much appreciate these three folks uh, spending time with us today. And please join me in thanking them. Thank you. <laughs>